series. Take lead. I've asked Pastor Joe to join me as we wrap up this series and talk about really the true purpose of the local church. It's what God has called us to do, and that is to make disciples. And as I look at Jesus Christ, and as you look at his life, as you read God's word, and you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find this, that Jesus is always healing people. You'll find that Jesus is always reaching out and touching the untouchables. He's forgiving the unforgivable. He's always doing something with people. In fact, you'll read in Acts 10.38, it says, Jesus went around doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So what was, what was that all about? It was all about this. Jesus was making disciples. And this is what God calls us to do, to make disciples. Recently, Pastor Joe and I had a chance to hear a, a great minister, Jim Simula. He pastors the Brooklyn Tabernacle uh, in, in New York, and it was so, uh, boy, what a powerful time that was. He was Amazing. ministering to pastors, and uh, he's been in Brooklyn Tabernacle for years. And uh, he told a story that after preaching, they have three services like we do. After preaching his third service, uh, he was tired. And I relate to that because after three, you get tired a little bit. I always have work to still do, but, but I know my habit is I'll get a cup of coffee, and I'll look at the work, and I'll eventually do this. <laughs> On my desk. That's my, that's my Sunday afternoons right there. Uh, so, I, so I got it when he said, I'm tired. Oh, I know what that feels like. I'm tired. And, uh, but he said he noticed a guy sitting out just a little ways out, and he's sitting at the edge of his stage. And he said, there's a guy that I didn't recognize. And he was looking. We made eye contact. And it was kind of like, I want to talk to you. So we said, come here. So the guy came up there, and he looked like in the area that they're in. It's a really rough area. And this guy looked like he was certainly a homeless uh, possibly drunk, and most likely just needed money. And Jim's thinking, I'm just tired. I just want to go home. So I'll, you know, I'll give him some money or something. I know we're not supposed to give. You know, normally he said we've got a, a process that we don't want to just give money in case that's not what they really need. So it'll help meet the need but not just give money. But he said, but I was just tired. I just wanted to go home. This guy came up there, and, uh, and he said he smelled so bad. It was a, it was a mixture of urine and feces and alcohol. See, he smelled so bad as I'm talking to him, I would kind of like take a breath this way and then just keep talking. And then I just figured, I know what he wants. He just wants money. So in my mind, I'm thinking, do I give him three or five? What do I do? And he reaches into his little money clip, pulls out his money. The guy puts his hand down and says, I don't want that. So what do you want? I want the Jesus you were talking about. That's what I want. So good. And isn't that what we all really need? So good. Don't we all really need Jesus because he's the only one that can actually change a person's life? He's the only one that can transform somebody. It was a powerful moment. And uh, didn't he like repent right there, yeah, Joe? The, actually, the, the, a supernatural moment in that story is as, as this guy asked for Jesus, it, it breaks Pastor Jim. And he repents out loud in front of this guy. He just looks up to heaven and he says, Father, forgive me. Forgive me for offering this guy something so temporal when what he wanted was eternal. And he begins to just weep. Well, at the same moment, this, this homeless man kind of falls into his arms. And there he is holding this man, weeping, repenting for God. And it's such a supernatural exchange happened. And he said, you know, as God is my witness... That, that smell that was so repulsive that I could barely breathe, he says in an instant, supernaturally, it became some, it was the most a pleasing aroma he had ever smelled in his life. He just breathed it in. It was so, so awesome. And what God was doing in that moment, and he spoke to him very clearly, he says, listen, Jim, if you cannot embrace that smell, which is the world, then I can't use you because what I want to do is transform what were the world's rags into heaven's riches through the power of grace. It was such a powerful moment. Yeah. And it's so, it's so good because this is what God has done for all of us. Didn't, doesn't scripture teach us that Jesus came while we were still sinners, when we still smelled bad, we were still a mess, and he embraced us. Yeah. He didn't push us away. He didn't send somebody else to embrace us. God came to the earth is in Jesus, God's son, took the form of a man, us, and he embraced us. And before Jesus left this earth, um, he said this. He said, Matthew 28, 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the mandate, Jesus who came to embrace uh, those that are filled with sin, us. Yeah. 
still smelling bad. Things aren't working out always good. He came to embrace us. And then Jesus, before he left this earth, he said, okay, here's, here's your mission now. Your mission now is to go and make disciples. It's so important that we keep that as our target because, you know, if you look at the church, the United States right now, so many places are, are getting off target as far as what we're called to do. Our purpose is to make disciples. If you look at Jesus' life, that was what he was all about. It was the next lost soul and empowering them and releasing them to become a son or daughter of God. If you look at his disciples and who he picked, I mean, these were, here was a bunch of ragtag, crazy, you know, wacky guys. I mean, Peter, John, James, I, I, Peter was always putting his foot in his mouth yeah. soon. At one time, I think Jesus, Jesus actually turned around and called Peter Satan. He did. And I know some yeah. of you may actually feel that way about your children at times, but... <laughs> You've still chosen these to raise these Get kids. Get behind me. Yeah. <laughs> James and John, there was a moment where they were all up in Jesus' business, and James and John are like, hey, do you want us to, like, call down fire and burn these people up so they'll leave you alone? It's like, that's, that's not what I came to do. You know, Jesus is like, that's not the spirit that I'm of. I'm, I'm come to give life, not destroy it with a nuclear bomb. That's not my call. And we, we have to know that, Joe, because when the Lord said, go and make disciples, you have to remember who he was telling go to. Yeah. It wasn't, he wasn't telling them go at the, at the year, years later when they all grew up, when they did get some more compassion and didn't want to burn people and fry them. When they were still not completely developed, not fully full grown, mm -hmm. he said go and make disciples. So, so today that word go is for every one of us. God calls all of us to go. And he calls you to go right where you are. Nobody gets to say, well, hey, when I get better, then maybe I'll go. In the meantime, I'll pray for those that do go. But I'm, I've still got this or I've still got that. Hey, the Lord tells all of us, go. And then he says, go and make disciples. And I love that disciples uh, are something you make. They don't just happen. You know, before long, you may have a beautiful turkey dinner at your house. And I have learned over years of experiencing that, that a great turkey dinner doesn't just happen. It doesn't just show up. Somebody has to make that. Somebody has to do some work and make that amazing. And disciples don't just happen. They're made. And God calls us, all of us, say, that's me. Come on, say it again. That's me. That's me. Yep, nobody gets to say, that's for them. That's me. Go right where you are and make Disciples. So, Joe, talk to us about, you know, what, what is a disciple? That's, what, that's the true purpose of the church. As we talk about taking the lead, that's one way you lead, yeah. is by making disciples. So, what is a disciple? It's a lot of what you said, you know, it's somebody who's in process. I mean, our, our goal isn't even just to make con converts or conversions. Uh, it's, it's way more than that. It's to invite people in this amazing journey of learning. And so and many times churches talk about, hey, these are, these are how many people converted to Jesus Christ, which is awesome when we celebrate that. But that conversion is a decision of the direction that you are now going. Like, you know, you're watching football games yesterday. Each down, every time they're advancing a ball, it's called a conversion because that's the direction that their team is going. However, in discipleship, discipleship is you're choosing your coach, that this is the coach, he calls the plays of my life, he's the one who's showing me how to win in this game, and so therefore I'm going to do what he says because I trust he knows better than I do. I've put myself in the position of a student or a learner for the rest of my life. That's what it means to make Jesus your Lord. Jesus is Lord. Now he sits on the throne of my heart and he instructs on how my heart should respond to things, how my heart should question things, how I should think about things because he's my life coach forever. That's, that's what a disciple is, someone who is constantly learning. Learning. You know, the Bible says that God is a wonderful teacher. And uh, as we celebrated Jerry Butterman's life yesterday, she was a teacher. And I've learned this about teachers. Teachers love to teach. If you've ever been around somebody who has, is, is a teacher or just has the gift of being a teacher. They love to teach you stuff. And, and God's word says that God is a wonderful teacher. And I want to encourage you today that God wants to teach you some things. He wants to teach you how to live a less stressed out life. Yeah. He knows how to do that. He wants to teach you how to live a life that is, is less freaked out. A, a life that is not filled with worry or fear. Like perhaps those around you are. All freaking out and wondering and worried about this. God wants to, is a wonderful teacher. He wants to teach you how you can actually live in a whole new dimension of peace. How you can live with, with a contagious joy in your life. There's so much good that God wants to teach you. He wants to teach you how to trust him more deeply. 
So I, I would encourage you, even as we talk, what is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who's learning. And it's interesting about learning. If you're going to learn, the only people that want to learn are people that are humble enough to want to learn. Yeah. Right? Because didn't we learn this about leadership already? Is that you've got to have a teachable attitude. Right? And so if you have a teachable attitude, then you can learn something. Yeah. So talk about your uncle. I know you learned from him. Yeah. And, well, if you look at, actually, just look at Jewish history. And, and that word that Jesus chose, disciple, it was very culturally relevant to those days. I mean, they, there was rabbis, and the rabbis would actually handpick the disciples, and those disciples will actually follow those rabbis. Now, it was to be a rabbi, you had to memorize the Torah. They've got to know this thing line by line, but there's a, there's a certain way to interpret it, so that rabbi would actually pass on how to interpret the scripture to his disciple. It was interesting, as you go through history, if that rabbi actually had like a side talent in blacks, uh, being like a blacksmith, he would also pass on that talent. So in our kind of uh, day in vernacular, that would be kind of an apprenticeship. You know, if you're somebody who's in the skilled trades, you understand that you shadow or job shadow somebody for a period of time, and you pick up that trade. And for me, it was just like that when in college, I would work for my Uncle Doug every summer, and he would learn and, or teach me construction. He owned a small construction company, and I would work for him summer making money for college and all that kind of stuff. And I'd, I'd pick up skills like roofing and framing and drywall and all that stuff. But way beyond that, I caught so much of his mannerisms, his humility, his character. And to this day, that, that stuff is still in me. Um, I saw that every time that we had a break, he was always the first one to pop up. And he would say things to me like, hey, when you're on a job site, you never sit down. You're always moving. There's always something that you can clean. And so he's teaching me work ethic, and I applied that work ethic wherever I went because I was an apprentice to him. Not only did I pick up the skill set that he taught me, but I also picked up his character. I became one of those disciples to him. And it's likewise with Jesus. We pick up his mannerisms. We pick up those things. The more and more time we spend with him, the more and more we'll catch his character. We'll catch how he loves. We'll respond like he, he responds and have the giftings and talents that his Holy Spirit equips us with. So go and then make disciples. That's, that's the great commission. And then he says, make disciples of all nations of the world. I mean, the, the, the call that God has for us is global. It is so big. He didn't say go make disciples of, of just those around you or those that you like to be around. Or He said you go make disciples of the, all the nations of the world. And I'm so glad that the great uh, commission, the great command that God has given us at Mount Hope, it's global. And God has made us into a local church that is having a global impact. We, are, we together are going to the nations of the world. Uh, just the other day I received a, a picture and a text message from Anthony Uboa, who came to Mount Hope years ago from the Ivory Coast. And uh, he came and received some training and got equipped here and then went back uh, to minister there. Uh, in the first five years... Uh, it seemed like nothing happened, like nothing was happening, and nothing, nothing good seemed to happen, but he stuck in there and hung in there. That's something he probably caught by being here, that you don't give up, you stick with it. So he stuck with it, and around the, somewhere between the fifth and the seventh year, he began to see some fruit and some increase. Now, there are, he has planted hundreds of churches uh, in the Ivory Coast, hundreds and hundreds of churches. Uh, and he has, led over, he has led over a million people to Jesus Christ. That's awesome. That's something worth celebrating. This is, this is an ordinary guy like you and me who said, I want to learn. I want to be that disciple. So I wanted to catch this this morning, that our calling is both to be a disciple and to make disciples. And as I've said recently, I want to pastor a New Testament church that makes disciples that makes disciples, that makes disciples, that makes disciples of other people. That's what God has called us to do, to make disciples. So let's move on and talk about well, how do you do that? Because, again, the call to make disciples isn't just for me. It's not for Pastor Joe. It's not for a few people here. It's for all of us. So how Amen. do you do that? And I want to share with you this morning my life story because my life story is the story of being discipled. Uh, by Pastor Dave Williams. When I was only 14 years old, he began to take me under his wing, and, and I began to learn and was taught. That's what disciples do. So let me give you three effective keys uh, this morning to making disciples. First is, is you have to be with people. God, you can't disciple somebody if you're not even with them, right? Bill Hybels called it the be with principle. Listen to this. I love it in John 1.14 in the message. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Isn't that a great picture? 
that God became flesh and blood through Jesus, and he moved into your neighborhood. What a great picture that God wants to be near you. He wants to be close to you. Mark 3.14 says, speaking of Jesus, he settled on 12 and designated them as apostles. The plan was they would be with him and he would send them out to proclaim the word. So here's the pattern. is first they would be with him and then they would be sent out. First they would be and then they would do. Do you know being always comes before doing? God is more concerned with who you're being than just what you're doing. And this was the example in my life. Again, we're at the age of 14. Pastor Dave began to take me under his wing. And, and uh, I remember when he said, hey, Kev, will you just come with me just to be with him and on hospital visitations on Thursdays? He said, I go visit the hospitals. Will you just come and be with me? Said, yeah. I remember going. I don't remember saying anything. I was just like a fly on the wall. I went into the hospital rooms, and Pastor Dave would pray for people, and I was just there. And then just to be with him, then afterwards we'd go out for some health food at McDonald's. <laughs> and, uh, since learned that's not health food. Um, <laughs> And we're supposed to learn as we grow, right? So still learning, learn that. And, uh, but I, I remember just little things, you know. Joe, you said it so well with your uncle that some things, you talked about catching things. And some things are better caught than they are taught. And most of what I began uh, to catch from Pastor David, it wasn't, it wasn't that he sat down and taught me and said, do this or don't do that. I just caught. I started to catch how to love people. I caught that people really matter, that God because God loves people, they ought to matter to us, and we ought to love people too. I caught that. I caught how to pray by just being around people that pray. It's one of the things I love about the Wednesday night prayer gathering because there's so many, uh, such a variety of people that are in there and where they're at in their spiritual journey. But we're all catching, we're all learning, we're all growing. So I caught leadership. I caught a heart for missions. I caught loving people. And it all was just by being with him. So I encourage you, you got to be with people. One of my, my goals for years has been, at the begin, beginning of the year, so as we're approaching a new year, is I would pray, Lord, who are three people that you want me to be with? You want me to strategically invest in? And I would never tell them. I'd never go, okay, let's pray, and you're one of my three, because nobody wants to feel like, I'm, what is that? I'm one of your three. Am I a project to you? Or nobody, nobody wants that. So I, they don't know it, but in my prayer journal, I would normally have three names of people that I would strategically want to invest in and just be with and be around them. So number one, you've got to be with people. I'm so thankful for that principle in my life. I know I wouldn't be in ministry if it wasn't for that principle because Pastor Dave poured into Pastor Kevin and then Pastor Kevin had interns that he was pouring into. One of those interns was Brad Swartout. Brad Swartout then went to go serve as the youth pastor at one of our um, first sent churches in Grand Blanc, Mount Hope Church under Pastor John Gallinetti, and he served there. And my wife and I had just gotten married at the same time. We landed in Grand Blanc, and we connected with him and started serving. But his philosophy that he had picked up from Pastor Kevin was to pour into people. And so he, he poured into my life. He showed me the way to do ministry and then released me into ministry. I'm so thankful that he had that. So I had all these amazing experiences. We were doing missions trips together. He taught me, let release me to lead worship, released me to teach young people the word of God and taught me how to be on a missions trip and eat cow udder if it's set in front of you in oh, strange dear. places. So thanks for passing that one on. That was, that was awesome. It's a principle that Pastor Kev always had to eat what's set in front of you when you're in the missions field. So I've, I've tasted a lot of crazy things. So, but those are just things that were passed on because they took the time to pour into people. And now that's what I'm doing. I get the joy and the privilege to pass on what Jesus has taught me through those people onto the next generation. And hopefully, if this is how this works, is each generation is getting better and better and better because the collective experiences and knowledge is being compounded with each generation and generation. So it's a really important key for us all. Another key for us for effective discipleship making is make sure that you are in the right environment. We are all designed to thrive when we're put in the right environment. I mean, creation. God has written this truth in creation. You can even see this with our, with our children. There's a nature and nurture thing. You know, there's certain things that just comes with the package. It just comes with their DNA. Some fortunate, some unfortunate. And there are other things that are caught because it's nurtured. It's put in the right environment. 
And throughout creation, you can see this principle, for example, if you take a palm tree, take a palm tree, put it in Michigan, and, you know, it's not going to survive long because one day it's going to be 70, and the next day it's going to be 30, and then, you know, it's palm the tree's dead. Yeah. So palm trees are actually designed that they don't ever go into dormancy, so that they don't have the tools to survive in Michigan. However, if you take that same palm tree planet in Florida where it's wonderfully warm <laughs> all year round, thank you, Jesus, for Michigan, and um, that thing will grow like 100 feet tall. It's amazing, amazingly resilient. It can actually withstand hurricane winds. It can bend 40 to 50 degrees and not snap. It's a powerful, amazing tree in the right environment. It's the same thing for all of us that when we're put in the right environment, you are designed to grow and thrive because God's got that written in your DNA. We're all sons and daughters that are connected to him. So Mark 4, 26 through 27 says this. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground night and day while he's asleep or awake. The seed sprouts and grows, but he does not understand how it happens. So the farmer understands that inherit the inside the seed comes with the power to multiply and bear fruit if he puts that seed in the right environment. So if he sees good soil, he cultivates that soil, plants that seed in that soil, then adds sunlight, adds water, adds time, that seed will do what it's called to do. The Word of God is very similar. The Word of God, if you plant it in your heart, it will do what it's designed to do if you continue to cultivate it with the warmth of God's love, His presence, God's people. It will continue to bear fruit in your life because it's simply in the right environment. Which is good, good for us all to get because you, you thrive in a certain environment. Uh, you and I are made to thrive in a certain spot. And I want to talk to you about some different environments because this is what Pastor Dave began to do with me as he was discipling me is he kind of made sure I would get to certain environments because he knew, as it says in Mark, if I just put myself there, if I get in that environment, growth will naturally take place all by itself yeah. if I just get there. And so what are, real quickly, what are a few of those environments? One is a worship environment. This is where I learned how to pray. I caught how to pray in a worship environment. I caught, and by the way, prayer, the essence of prayer is all about knowing who God is. That's what prayer is all about. So in a worship environment like this, you're, you're going to grow. You have the opportunity to know God better, as it says in Colossians 1.10. With every day, we ought to know God better and better. And so Pastor would say, hey, Kev, you want to be there on Sunday? And he would kind of direct me to and make sure this was a regular part of my life because he knew if I, if I got into this environment, as well as a prayer meeting environment and then a personal times of prayer, I would know God better. And so he would direct me there and lead me there. The crazy thing in our society is, is that even though God's word says that the more we see the day of the return of Jesus approaching, all the more that we should gather together. And, yet, you know, the, the trend is, I read it years ago in USA Today, the trend is, is that people come to church, a gathering, a corporate gathering like this, they come less and less. USA Today said uh, it's just decreasing and decreasing. And Joe, you were said something recently. Yeah, actually, uh, more recent statistics have shown that about 75% of conf confessing Christians will go to church on average once a month. So, I mean, do quick math. That's 12 times a year that you're spending time connected to God's body, which he, he gathers his people together. So 12 times a year, and then we're expecting to always uh, understand what God, what the direction's God going. We want to respond in the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We want to have great spiritual relationships. We want to grow and thrive. However, I mean, just look at any, any profession, any yeah. athletic, you yeah. are not going to get out if you don't invest the time. If exactly. I, I competed in athletes and in athlete, athletics in college and throughout my life. If I didn't spend time practicing when it came game time, I was going to fall apart. It's the same thing with us. We come together to learn and grow in these times to connect one another so that when it comes game time, we've got the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We, we are connected with the people that can help us through tough times. And this is what we can never forget. The Bible says that when two or three are gathered, he's right here in the midst of us. I mean, that's what makes, that's what makes this powerful. Mm -hmm. This is not just a gathering of people. You can have that anywhere. This, we are gathered, and the king of kings is right here in the midst of us. Amen. And when you're around certain people, they tend to rub off on you. And you catch some things. So when we're gathered before God's throne of grace, you're not meant to leave empty-handed. I read a sign years ago on my way driving to church. You know how some churches have signs, and they say things on them? That's what signs do. And sometimes they're kind of hokey. This sign said... Um, have trouble sleeping? Try church. Well, no, why? Like, 
I wanted to stop and take that off of their sign. Because church should not be what puts you to sleep when, when God's people gather. It ought to put life on the inside of you. Amen. You ought to feel more alive and more energetic and something good of God's spirit got poured into you and downloaded on the inside of you. I think our gatherings every Sunday are powerful. I think every time we gather in a Wednesday night per gathering, I think it's powerful Amen. when we do that. Yeah. I think when you gather with your family to pray and to know God better, I think it's powerful every time. I think it's key to your growth. So real quickly, the environments that are key, that if you get in the right environment, you will grow. And these are the environments that as you are called to make disciples, that you're encouraging other people to be part of too. The first is that worship environment. Secondly, is it a relational environment? It's good to have a big meeting like this, but I've learned this. People are helped by people, not by programs. Yeah. And so you've got to connect people with people. People are going to help other people grow. Yeah, if Ecclesiastes 4.9 says this, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. And Jesus in John 17 actually unfolds that the greatest witness to the world is how we love one another. If somebody comes in that's never experienced church and he experiences this, this mass of people that love each other despite age, despite ethnicity, despite eth economic uh, status, we truly love each other, that's what's going to speak to the lost person the most is that love. And, and for our own health and our own good, the process of learning love only happens when we gather together in, in types of settings like this. And love has been kind of twisted and, and manipulated into different things that it really is not. What love is is really sacrifice. You know, the Bible talks about that Jesus actually laid down his life for other people. And that's the greatest sign of love is laying down your life for somebody else. And so in these moments where we come together in these relationships and these exchanges, that's where you actually get the, get the friction that causes you to sharpen in the things of God. This is actually a proverb 27 through uh, or 27.17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. So when we come into moments like this and we have those relationships rub, it gets, gets me sharper and sharper in the things of God because you have a perspective and I have a perspective. And through that, I grow in what I understand. So how are we ever going to learn how to forgive unless you ever experience the wonderful opportunity of being offended? So I should offend you. Yes, yes. You smack me and whatever. <laughs> so when somebody offends you, now you have the opportunity to see that the gospel truth works. So instead of it's holding true. this bitter rage against this person and getting into this hate-filled life and, and having that run and rule my life, instead I can say, well, Jesus, my coach and whom I'm following, he says to forgive those that offend me. Yeah. So I'm going to forgive right now and I'm going to see what happens. So then I exercise forgiveness and I see that the grace and the mercy of God actually triumphs over evil and actually does a way better job of reestablishing that relationship or patience like for example on Friday when I'm playing soccer and somebody puts me on the floor because they elbow me I have to take a deep breath and exercise patience thank God for that guy even though he was completely wrong in doing that but I get, I get to exercise the fruit and see that you know what a brawl didn't fight out because I exercised patience instead I went up and shook his hand and it totally smoothed it over we went on to win the game anyway so so we won. So it was a good thing. Did you shake his hand really hard? Like no, I like... tried not to. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. But it's in those relationship, those relational environments that's so important and so healthy for our, for our growth. And people come into church and talk about, you know, hey, those are imperfect people and they're messed up. They say one thing and they're doing another thing. That's right. You know, we are an all in process. Yep. The moment that you walk through the door, it became imperfect. The moment I walked in the door, it became an imp imperfect environment. However, that's why relationship is so important because this exchange that's happening helps us get over ourselves live and do things that are better, which is selfless, and we yeah. learn to live life in a better way to give than always receiving. In God's word, there are 37 one another's that say you should love one another, yeah. forgive one another, bear one another's burdens, and you can't even do those without being closer to people. Yeah. So to grow as a disciple, a learner of Jesus, you've got to get close to some people so you can practice some of those one another's. You know, nobody succeeds spiritually alone. Everybody needs a somebody to help them. And so you've got to put yourself in a place where you're going to be 
uh, closer in relationship. And that's what Pastor Dave did with me. He began to invite me up first, you know, do you want to be there on Sunday and this, this worship environment? And then invited me to come to a, a Bible study at his house into a smaller environment. And then the first leadership class that he taught, pace setting leadership in his office. It's me and about five other guys. So it was a smaller setting, but I was catching things there in that tighter setting that I needed to catch. So you want to you want to be there for the worship environment, you want to be there for the smaller relational environment, and then also you want to be in a serving environment. And this is again what Pastor Dave did for me is he began to stretch me. He saw gifts in me that I didn't even see in myself. And so as a young man, uh, he began to stretch me and he said, "I want you to lead a Bible study. I don't even know how to lead a Bible study." I wouldn't know how to do that. It was stretching me, but he saw something in me that someday would be able to do that. So when I said, I didn't know how, he said, well, you don't have to know how. And he had a, a recording. He said, you just pl 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 play this button, push this button, and a guy's going to start preaching that knows how to do a Bible study. And all you have to do is push the button. So I can push a button. So I pushed the button, and he said, and then just ask questions after. I can do that. So before I knew it, we had... You know, 30, 40 uh, kids coming out to his house, and I'm leading <laughs> a Bible study. And then I really liked that. So I started a Bible study in my school and had 40 kids coming every Tuesday for a Bible study. Then eventually, when I was 16, he said, now I want you to preach on Sunday night. <laughs> hey, I don't know how to do that. Like, I'd never preached at all, but I will never forget that Sunday night. In fact, my mom gave me a, a tape recording of that night. And I listened to it, and I always wondered why nobody responded to the altar call. I remember giving the altar call, and nobody came. And I felt so bad, I thought, well, I will respond, because this was horrible. So I responded to my own altar call, because nobody else came. I've been there. So I came down, and I got on my hands and knees, and I, I said, oh, I looked out, and said, oh, Lord, Lord. <laughs> I said, forgive me, I know that was really bad. <laughs> I mean, it was really bad. Like, I'm still, obviously, I'm still in process. But then I listened, that was really bad. And I wondered, now I know why nobody came. Because I listened to that painfully. I listened to that recording. And I was telling people, you know, you're not doing anything for God. And if you need to get up, you're not doing anything. It's time that you do something. And now come. If that's you, come. <laughs> Who's going to come? <laughs> What was I think? No wonder. No wonder nobody came. But my point is, in a serving environment, it should stretch you. Somebody, for you, should tap into your gifts and stretch you there. For you to disciple somebody else, you have to tap into their gifts. That, of course, are probably not fully developed yet, but you see potential in them. And you start to put them in a place where they're going to be stretched to start using their gifts. You know, a rubber band can't even be used unless it's what? Stretched. Faith cannot even be used unless it's stretched. So you want to get people into a place where it's stretching them. It's making them start to exercise and use that gift. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work. Do you know you have a special work to do? You have a part to play. And when you play your part, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body, the whole body of Christ is healthy, it's growing, and it's full of love. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help somebody else. Do you know the spiritual gift that God has given you is not even for you? It's given so you can help somebody else. No. And Hebrews 6, 11 tells us, our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts. And watch this. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Do you know that you getting in that serving environment and using that gift to serve somebody else, that's part of what keeps, keeps you from being spiritually dull. So if you ever feel kind of spiritually dull, like it's, things aren't happening or I'm not moving, well, maybe it's because you need to get yourself into an environment where you, you're serving. And, and those gifts aren't about you. It's about somebody else that you're serving. Keeps you sharp. I said years ago, a person wrapped up in himself is a mighty small package. And isn't that true? If we're all wrapped up into just us, even our gifts aren't about us. Yeah. It's always about somebody else. I just had a text from a, a girl that was in our youth group years ago, and she's uh, out at uh, um, 
the Dream Center out in LA, and just to hear her text is so refreshing because you know she's she's had a rough upbringing, and now she's having the opportunity of serving homeless people on Skid Row, and she's just come to life. She's just absolutely on fire now, just to see the transformation that's happened. And, and really, what I think has happened is instead of like the whole thing navel gazing where you're just so wrapped up in yourself, now she's she's moved her her gaze and her goal off of herself, and she, now she's. Uh, looking at other people's issues, and it's helped her grow tremendously, and it's dramatically fulfilled her because now she understands that her life has meaning and has purpose. It's not just to exist. It's actually to pass something on and help somebody else who may be less fortunate. Which leads us to the third key in making disciples. For you to make disciples, first, you've got to be with them. Secondly, you want to help encourage them to get in the right environment where they're going to grow. Thirdly, be intentional and pass it on. This is so key. Um, Jesus uh, came to this earth as a baby. He lived his life as a sinless man. He died on the cross, and he rose from the dead. And he did that not so we would just come and have a meeting. His purpose in doing that was so that we would pass on what's been given to us, so that we would actually be disciple makers. And I want to encourage and and also challenging you this Sunday to, to be more than a church goer, determined to say, I, I want everybody here to say, I will be a disciple maker. As imperfect as you are, right? Not waiting until you're all fixed and you're all, but as you are, I will be. This is what I'm looking for. Man, we're going to walk out of here saying, being commissioned, just like Jesus said, okay, go and make disciples. That today we would all be sent out saying, go and we're going to make disciples. Pass it on. This is what Paul spoke to Timothy about. He said this in 2 Timothy 2.2 in the J.B. Phillips translation. It says, everything that you have heard me preach in public, you should in turn entrust to reliable men, reliable people, who will be able to pass them on to others. I realize that I have a responsibility to take what God has entrusted to me and to pass it on to somebody else who will be able to pass it on to somebody else who in turn will be able to pass it on to somebody else, who in turn will pass it on to somebody else. So as I stand grateful approaching Thanksgiving, I'm grateful for all that God has poured into me. I'm grateful for the people that God has brought into my life to invest in me, to believe in me when I didn't even believe in myself, uh, to pour into me. I'm grateful for every time in the secret place and hearing the whispers of the Holy Spirit encourage me and pour courage inside of me. And out of all the good from the life verses God has given me and all these things, all that good, I feel a sense of responsibility to pass that on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so it it looks like this. Um, When I take the good that God has poured into me, and there's so many things that all couldn't fit in this little guy, but, you know, it would be like this huge, but for the sake of example, all the good that God has and continues to pour in me. I'm not meant to just hold on to that. It's not meant to stay here. Follow me? I'm meant to find somebody who's reliable, who I think will in turn pass that down to somebody else. So as Pastor Dave passes on to me what God has put on the inside of him and done with him, what he has learned, then I take that. I find reliable people like Pastor Joe, and I pass that on to him. So you got to catch it, though, Joe. I'm, I'm That's sorry. The thing. I'm sorry. Okay? So I wasn't quite ready. The key word is reliable, right? <laughs> reliable. So let's, I'm sorry. Let's, okay, let's. My fault. My fault. So, I'm sorry. I wasn't ready. I was ready. I, sometimes I was still reliable takes me. time. I was just like, but you see the potential in them. And I'll track in this. <sighs> okay, and then this. you pass it on to them. That's how it works, just like this. that. I got it. I got it. But then Joe just doesn't give it back to me because now he's responsible. He's got to go find somebody else, Right? That will be reliable, not perfect, but reliable. Someone that he thinks uh, can pass it on to somebody else. So go find somebody. Hey, uh, balcony, ready? Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> there was some guy up there. Oh, was wow. Like, yeah. That's going to be something. I'm right ready. ready. So it's my call now. He's passed it on to me. I want to pass it on to somebody else. And then it's his call to find somebody to pass it on to somebody else. So I, I go for the balcony, man, seriously. <laughs> And this is the picture. The picture that is, is the gospel just keeps on being passed on, passed on, and yeah. passed on, and passed on. Here's the thing. Every Christian has a responsibility to multiply. The first command God gave us was be fruitful and multiply. First, be fruitful. So every fruitful Christian should multiply themselves into other fruitful Christians. 
right? Every fruitful church should multiply and have, make more fruitful churches. Every fruitful learner, follower of Jesus should multiply. So once you're fruitful, not perfect, right? Once you're fruitful, it's time to multiply. And as I look at this, uh, this uh, tremendous church family, um, I, I can't help but think there are people here that are so good that I think it would be a crime and it would be a sin not to multiply that. Right? This is such a remarkable church family. So just, I got to get closer because my glasses aren't on. Uh, but I see Erwin, Kendrick, my friend here. He said, oh, no, here he comes. Yeah, he sure does. Never know what's going to happen when PK's up, right? Uh, Erwin is a good man. Uh, he's a godly man. He's a good dad. He's a good husband. And I think there's so much good. You know, just being around you, Erwin, you've got a smile that's contagious. And you've got some joy in you that's contagious. You've got leadership in you. And that's so good that it would be a crime not to pass that down to somebody else. Like, I think it would be a shame for that just to end someday when Erwin ends. It's not supposed to happen that way. So it's important that, that Irwin does what we all have to do and as we're approaching a new year, say, God, who do you want me to strategically invest my life in? And then do that. Then just be with them. You don't, you don't have to tell them what you're doing. Just be with them. Invite them. I, for years I've done this. I would just invite people to come along with me as a youth pastor. When I have something from changing the oil to doing Christmas shopping, they're like, hey, Joe, just come on. Let's come with me. Go, go for a ride. Because I, I knew if, he, if I'm just with him, then I'm going to hope that some good is going to get passed on to him. Yeah. As I'm hanging out with kids at St. Vincent's just playing basketball, I'll say, what, Lord, what good is this doing? Then I, rem oh, then I remember, oh, I'm being with them. And being with them, there's some good that's going to rub off on them. And I can speak a word of hope. I can, I can have one, one thing that I hope to get in them every time I see them, every, every uh, Thursday. It may be one, one week it was, as I'm asking the Lord on the way there, it was just don't give up. Just kind of communicate that. So as we're playing basketball, he keeps missing the shot. Hey, just don't give up. And that's good for all of life, not just basketball. Just to try and impart something. But sometimes you don't have to say anything. You just got to be with them, be around them. Troy, uh, I've known you for years. And... Uh, you have such a passion for healing like nobody else that I know. You know God's word is true. You know that God is a healer. Uh, and I, and it, it, it delights me that I see you strategically passing it on to somebody else. Because it's so good and so needed in the body of Christ that it can't stop with you. Um, and, the, and the list goes on and on. Is Diane Dalton here? Are you here, Diane? Probably in the 1130 Powerful service. Story. I see uh, Jose and Joselita. They've been uh, helping me and Amanda out at MSU reach uh, yeah. international students. Thank you. They're so loving. They're so much fun. They're just great people. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I remember, Jose, you telling me, I've just been like waiting for this. Because inside, you want to pass that on to somebody else. So Heidi Baker in Mo Mozambique, an orphanage there, she had... Uh, kids, and she bought them a piece of chocolate candy for Christmas as a Christmas gift. These kids have never had a candy bar, never had one, didn't know what it was. And so she explained, you eat it, and she gave them all a candy bar. And this is what these little teeny kids did, young kids. Their first, they, they took a bite. After their first bite, without hesitation, do you know what they did? They started breaking up into pieces and giving it out to somebody else. Like, this is so good, I can't just keep this for me. So when you encounter Jesus and you encounter uh, his nature and who he is to you, he is so good that you can't keep him to yourself. And so God's word says, as freely as you have received, freely you should give. So the question is, what has God given you? So I say, Pastor Kevin, what do I have to give? Oh, the question is, what has God given you? That's what you have to give. Has God given you some comfort through difficult times? Oh, then you have some comfort to give somebody else. Has God healed you? Oh, well, then you have some healing to give somebody else. Has God given help to you? Well, then great, then you can give some help to somebody else. If, you, if you've received some love, some kindness, whatever you have freely received, that's what you get to freely give. So I'm asking you today as we wrap up the Take the Lead series, uh, very intentionally talking about discipleship. 
Making disciples, because one of the ways you take the lead exactly where you are, where you bloom, where you are planted, is by determining you will be a disciple maker. And for some of us, you know, they may just be a parent in the room. Mom and dad, your kids are your greatest disciples. They are your most important investment. So pouring into them and passing on the legacy of what you've learned from Jesus Christ onto them is priority number one. Absolutely. I love the quote that says, the, the light that shines the brightest at home shines the farthest. Our first priority is to make sure that our families are powerful representations of the kingdom of God. And so yeah. we can never slight our children by thinking that they're not a disciple. That is your core disciple yeah. right there. That's so true, Joe. Yeah. I know that I will be, I will, we all will be held accountable before God with what we did in this world. This little, little bit of time we have before mm -hmm. Jesus returns. And I know that I will be held accountable uh, for my family, um, people that God's given me opportunity. Jesus prayed it this way. In John 17, Jesus said to the Father, he said, Father, I pray for those you've entrusted to me. And so I'm asking you, who are those God has entrusted to you? Because those are the ones that you're going to want to invest in. God, who, who have you entrusted me mm -hmm. to lead? Who have you entrusted me to pray for? Who have you entrusted to me to invest in and pour my life into them? So they can then go pour their life into somebody else. We have a mandate as a church to disciple the soul zone. To have a completely, when Jesus returns, to present a completely discipled region. 50 miles around Mount Hope Church. Well, that's not going to happen with just Pastor Kev. It's going to happen is every one of us make a disciple who makes a disciple who then makes a disciple who then makes a disciple. Mm -hmm. So will you... Freely give what's been given to you. If you would say, yes, Pastor Kev, I'm in, uh, and I want to be part of making disciples, not just hearing this and thinking that's good for them, but yeah, I will, with God's help, I will determine as we approach a brand new year that I'm going to spend next year being strategic about not just being a disciple, but making a disciple of somebody else. If you will say yes to that, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right where you are, from the balcony to the main floor. And think about it. You'll say, yes, I'll do that. Again, I'm not looking for perfect people. Again, God called Peter and, and that crew, and they were not far from perfect. Yeah. We already learned that God's not looking for perfect people, but people with perfect hearts, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, do me a favor, will you? And everybody just sit back down for just a minute. Because I'm just slightly concerned that everybody just stood up. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was just because everybody else is standing up. I guess I should stand up. I'm, I'm seriously asking you, will you make disciples? Will you invest your life? Will you take all the good that God has put in you? And will you strategically, with God's help, pour that into somebody else? It's something you will actually do with God's help. If that's you, please stand to your feet. I do want to pray for you. Wow. God bless you. For some of you, uh, from the balcony to the main floor, uh, your first step is to be a disciple, <laughs> to be a follower of Jesus. And if you've not asked God to forgive you of your sins and made your peace with God, uh, then that's, that's the first step for you. You need to first be a recipient of God's amazing grace and love so then you've got something in the account to give away to somebody else. I don't have the ability, and nor does Pastor Joe or any person uh, here, we don't have the ability to convince you that you need to be saved, but the Holy Spirit, who is here, he has the ability to convince you. In fact, it's what he does. He convinces you that you need a savior that you need to be born again. He convinces you that you can't save yourself. He convinces you that you can't get to the end of life and hope that your good will outweigh your bad, but you are in the same boat as all of us, and that we all have sinned, and we all need a Savior.
If that's you and you say, Pastor Kev, would you pray for me because I need to be born again today. I need to make my peace with God. Would you just raise your hand and wave it at me? Would you? All over this place, wave it at me. Thank you. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Honey, real quickly, it'd help if you, thank you, sir. Honey, real quickly, just wave it at me. Up in the balcony. God bless you. God bless you. Joe, do this for me. For those that raised their hands that I could see, and if I didn't see you, God saw you, right? Uh, Joe, would you lead them in a prayer? Absolutely, yeah. We just ask that you mean this from the bottom of your heart because God's listening. He hears every word that you know, falls from your lips. So in this moment, just repeat this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you went to the cross for me. You were crucified for my sins. You were buried on the third day. You came back to life. I give my life to you. My entire life to you. And from this moment forward, I'm following you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer, we'd love to, love to hear from you. Tell somebody before you leave that I prayed that prayer with Pastor Joe. And, and for, for all those standing who say, I will, I will be a disciple maker. Listen real closely to me, will you? What, what you have to give is what you receive. It's all about overflow. It's not, it's not even taking just what somebody else, like you can, you can listen to TV preachers and they're, they're good. They're better preachers than I am. Uh, so, but you can listen to these guys and get stuff to give. But I'm telling you, what's powerful that you have to give is specifically what God gave you. Not just what God gave them, or I heard that person say that, or I think that was a good idea. But what is God speaking to your heart? Like what, what of God's nature are you experiencing? What about God's character and nature are you you're kind of learning some more about? That's the powerful thing that you have to give to somebody else. The good that you have to give is all the good that's on the inside. If you will just get around people, ask the Holy Spirit to take some of that good and let it rub off on somebody else. I want to pray for you that God's going to make for some strategic divine connections between you and some other people that God wants you to invest in. Jesus prayed first, then he selected 12 disciples. God, I'm praying first, then I'm asking you to direct me to select people you want me to invest my life in. People that I will throw the rest of my life into. I will give them more than just good news, I will give them my very own life. We will eat together, we will laugh together, we will cry together, we will pray together, we'll celebrate together. That's what you're signing up for. I'm telling you, it is the adventure of a lifetime. I want that same adventure for you. Father, I pray for every person standing. First, I give you thanks for all the good that you've put, up, put on the inside of them. I thank you for the works of grace that they've personally experienced. I thank you for the mercy that they have received, the kindness from you that they have received. Lord, I'm asking that you would cause strategic, divine connections to take place between them and the individuals that you want them to pour and invest into. God, I pray their time of being with people will be powerful. I pray as they encourage to be in a worship environment, their times of worship and praying together will be powerful. And I pray that every good thing, according to Hebrews 13, every good thing you poured into them to do your will, that will be passed on to somebody else. Will then pass on to somebody else who then will pass on to somebody else. The Jesus, when you return, we can, we can together present to you an entirely discipled region. It's that area that we affectionately call the soul zone, 50 miles around Mount Hope Church. God, I ask this, and I speak it as a blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you.
Have a great day. And hey, if you need further prayer, there will be ministers here that would love to pray with you. God bless and have a great Sunday. And if you have the baseball, I need that back. We have one more service. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Frank. God bless you. Yeah.